What we like in a smell is determined by our culture and environment. Making scent for Western tastes used to be easy, but things are changing. The European business and the American business have not enjoyed tremendous success over the last few years, and these other regions are exploding. But the new customers don't all want the same thing. The Russians want rich and heavy. The Chinese crave light and airy. And the Brazilians go bananas for fruits. You wouldn't use that in a perfume, would you? I would. I would. What we want in a perfume depends on where we are, but also when we are. In Arabia, they lust for musky oriental scents that were all the rage in Victorian England. I brought some treasure to show you, the best of English perfumery. The tastes of London, Paris and New York will soon count for little. What we smell like in the future is more likely to be dictated by the customers of Shanghai, Mumbai and Sao Paulo. Ah. Anne Gottlieb's nose is small but influential. She's a predictor of global scent tastes. Then see if you can make it at three, and, and if we can get the test at nine. The Manhattan-based grandmother works regularly for a top designer we can't name. His perfumers are developing a new fragrance aimed at Chinese women, whose tastes are changing fast. You seem very thoughtful. I'm really concerned about the viability of this fragrance. As much as I love it and, and the direction in which it's going, um, Asia is a very important market for us, and I don't know whether or not this is going to work there. I just am not sure it'll work there. Here, this is the more different woody note. This is more yeah. ambrox. This right. is more woody. Vetiver, cedar, this kind of woodiness. So this is the same as I'm wearing yes. with a tweak on top. Just There's a big sociological piece of what I do in understanding what the tastes of the women of India and the men of India are, what the tastes of the Chinese are. I'm not sure. I'm Smell. not sure. No. OK, come back again. Yeah. What happens here for me is that I go back into a little bit of that animalic dirtiness, mm -hmm. which I don't in the wrist. I so I think what I would like to do is take that and that. Okay. Because for me, those are the two that maintain the integrity of the fragrance that I love. Fans in Europe and North America might also like this perfume, but they're not going to get a sniff of it. Because specific regions are such lucrative businesses, yes, specific fragrances would be created by him for those regions. And not available here in North America or in Europe? Um, probably not. What we are doing now are regional fragrances that are available only in certain locations. It's my responsibility to make sure that a fragrance that is supposed to be region appropriate is so. Gottlieb's office on Central Park is filled with trophies. For four decades, big name clients have had huge successes following her advice on Western tastes. These days, her nose takes her east and south. Gottlieb isn't limited to fine fragrance. Thanks to her, adolescent youth the world over smells pungently sexy. One of the projects that I've worked on, and I've worked on it for 20 years, is Axe, the body spray. That we call Lynx. That you call Lynx in the UK. It is targeted really to teenage boys yes. and I feel very much like its mother and we do a new one every year and we get them pretty right. Historically, Link scents have been tuned to European tastes but Anne's going to change that. The brand's HQ is in London 
and that's where she's heading. On the banks of the River Thames sit the offices where the future of Lynx or Axe is planned. Teenage scent tastes change fast, and there's a new body spray every year. It's worn by boys all over the world, but Gottlieb knows that the smell of the next one will be dictated by just one territory. There is one country, one country, that matters more to Lynx and to Axe than any other, and that's Brazil. They are fragrance literate and they love fragrance. So the potential is huge there, probably bigger than any other region in the world. For brand manager Russell Taylor, there are practical reasons why the spray does so well in Brazil. What we find in a lot of our Latin American markets is that they use more product. They want fresher fragrances and they shower more as well. So the usage occasions in hotter climates are very, very different from, uh, from the colder climates. And that's effectively where the, the drive of growth on the brand comes from. Three teams of perfumers are in competition. This group believes they've got Brazil bottled. This is a coveted brief. This represents a lot of money. Um, to the house that wins. And if they hear that their fragrances are not loved or that they're not promising, it's very disappointing for them. There's a good chance we'll, there will be tears. We are um, at, the, at this point in our evaluation where um, I know that we're not so happy. And so we would like to take a look at where we are here. Let's just smell, okay? We are designing a product that is specifically for a 16 to 25 year old consumer. You would tend to do a product that would smell young. Um, someone in this room is fascinated with the coconut part. <laughs> Brazilians love fruity ingredients. They love floral ingredients. So that what I am looking for captures that, but also something that really is tasty and yummy, and yet decidedly masculine. Do you want to smell both themes, maybe on skin? Oh, de let's definitely go to skin, yes. And I'm so happy that you brought skin with you, so. Oh, it is. Yeah. The skin executive represents a teenage boy. He's probably lived on pot noodles and gone without showers for a week. Okay, let's have a look. Coconut is a yummy ingredient. Um, what I would really love to do to keep the fragrance sophisticated is find a way of sort of wrapping it so that the sweetness so much isn't there. What if we mix the two? Pierre, come smell and see if you think it would work. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's pretty feasible. Fragrance development is a journey. We're on a journey here. If we make this one-dimensional, then obviously we will fail, but you won't make it one-dimensional. And I think the magic now we need to see coming through from you is something that you want to smell and smell and smell and smell. Our guys are going to remember this fragrance. Exactly. You know, you guys need to do a lot more work, yeah? So let's, let's not be lazy now and say, oh, this is it, yeah? But I think, please, you know, work on the sophistication so we don't come across as being too cheap. It's worth the pain. The contract for just one new version will pay millions. It's a global brand and uh, it's a, a huge, huge, huge contract for us. So to win it, um, we have a pretty big party. Gottlieb still has to see the competing teams. Then she'll go to Brazil to ask teenagers for their opinion. It seems as though that, that there's quite a lot of work still to be done, though. Well, there certainly is. We aren't finished with the process at all. And the next few weeks are a crunch period for all of us. I will be meeting with the fragrance houses on a, a, a few days a week um, as they create, I evaluate, they go back again, create again. It, it's a, a, an elaborate process. Mm. And I will be taking to Brazil um, what I hope will be one single can of fragrance and relying on the data that comes out of this 
to tell us whether or not we have a fragrance that's done. Brazil's opinion matters. It's the fastest growing fragrance market on earth. The people love anything perfumed. The latest craze is for tutti frutti scented footwear. Everyone who can spends something on scented products, from perfume to air fresheners. To cap it all, when the temperature soars and the humidity gets too much, they shower it off and start all over again. For the fragrance industry, Brazil is the perfect storm. Even car dealers are fragrance obsessed. This is the Aston Martin scent. Everyone coming to our showrooms will smell the scent. We can give them a, a, a small bottle for free. Not for free, you know. <laughs> Nothing is free. Brazil used to be politically unstable, which made foreign investors wary. But all that's changed. So we are in business for about three months. Initially, we thought uh, we had a market in Brazil for around uh, 25 units a year. But uh, to our surprise, we sold already 25 in less than uh, three months. They know that when they buy one car like this, they are paying more taxes than the value of the car, but they still want to have uh, one of these babies. The whole country is coming up. We're having a lot more people in this country uh, move to the uh, middle class. Things are looking up for some. Most people can't afford a bicycle, let alone an Aston Martin. But everybody wants a piece of Brazil's new wealth. Those who aren't rich can at least smell as though they are, but not with posh perfumes. The real money isn't in eau de toilette, it's in toilet cleaner. The big chemical companies are climbing over each other to make Latin bathrooms and kitchens rainforest fresh. Flavia Motta works for the biggest fragrance corporation of all, Givadam. Okay, so here we are. For her, every day is laundry day. So different types of washing machines. So we have top loads that are very common in Brazil. Not so common in Brazil, the front loads. We also use drying machines. We wash towels with different fragrances in all these machines so that then we can compare how we perceive this fragrance in the different moments, in the different washing phases. When it, we pour the product inside the machine, when it is soaking, then when it's washing, after when the cycle finishes, to make sure that the fragrance develops, performs. It, the best way in all these moments because all of them are very important for the performance of the product but there are some that are what we call the, the magical moments the magical moments the magical moments the ones that are the key ones for the decision on a product so this is one of the magical moments when we talk about detergent powders the cycle has just finished I open the machine I take it out smell it in this way is that the magical moment there? That's, That's one of those. Yes, job well done. There's a, a very touching story. When once in a visit up north to very low income consumers was a couple with four kids, the six of them would share the two beds. And although she was extremely poor, one of the best moments in her day was when they went to bed. And I said, why, why is that? because she owned just one bed sheet for each bed, but she would wash it every day. This washing powder would make the bed sheet very clean and above all perfumed. It was a way for her to, of inclusion to be able to afford 
if she could not afford perfume itself, fragrance would come through products that she used in the house. Whenever Brazil visits the bathroom, Givadar goes with them. There are around 50 million households in Brazil. All the perfumers have to do is correctly decipher their tastes. The problem is they're changing with ever-increasing speed. In the past, scent fashions evolved more slowly. The Victorians loved rich, musky fragrances. Those tastes lasted for decades before the British fell in love with lighter perfumes. Simon and Amanda Brooke have recreated a Victorian perfume company. They hope the scents of the past can be their future, but can they really turn back the taste clock? You need to do this with your nose. <sighs> really breathe out hard and fast and then smell in very slowly. The Brooks are not trained perfumers and turn to scent savant Roger Dove for advice. So this is Rose de May. Dove is a perfumer who champions the grand fragrances of yesteryear. He provides a sketch of the scent tastes of the 1890s. Jasmine suggests something a little bit more you know, a button undone, a bit of décolleté on show. So the two together start to give you something which is just very feminine and luxurious. Uh, this jasmine you have, uh, you're smelling here, costs just over double the price of gold bullion. Despite their reputation for sobriety, Victorians would lose control at a whiff of civet, the smell of a wild cat's anus. Uh, this material is now banned as a natural material. Um, I have a little cache of it, which I've had for years. Um, so I thought that this warranted smelling the real stuff. Um, it's quite interesting when you smell civet to think that uh, in Ethiopia, where it comes from, brides bathe in it, grooms put it in their hair as a pomade on the wedding night, and uh, in Britain, in Georgian Britain, this was the scent of the dandy mm -hmm. because it smells totally fecal. Mm. So be prepared, it's not the prettiest thing you're ever likely to smell. Mm. Very, very sensual. I mean, this is the, the animal world. It's it's nice it's good. Something. Yeah, it's you have come a long way. If, if you don't <laughs> think Simmons are it, then you have come a long way. <laughs> Simon and Amanda Brooks' home used to smell of air freshener and occasionally Old Spice. Now, on Monday mornings, Rose de May, Tonka Bean and a Poppernax intermingle with bacon and egg. Simon Brooke was interested in his family tree. Three generations back was John Grossmith, perfumer by royal appointment. The real treasure, which is here, and I ought to have my white gloves on for this, but here you have in John Lipscomb Grossmith's own hand the original formulae for almond oil brilliantine, almond shaving cream, hygienic salts. Oh, and here's a special one, Regal, which was produced for King Edward. Here we have... Ah, this is a good one. Hasuno Hana. So with rose and jasmine. New mown hay. With lots of jasmine and rose and orange, oak moss and civet. And page after page, clearly the perfume or the creativity of those sorts of things was in his genes. In bringing a long dead perfumery back to life, the Brooks have changed their own. They sold the weekend cottage and gave up their old jobs to recreate three antique scents. This isn't my best attempt. It'll, it'll turn out looking all right. I read archaeology at university 
Uh, but when I graduated, I became an accountant. We acquired the company because it, it seemed a kind of tidy thing to do. It was about get, saying, oh, well, let's get this back into the family. It used to belong to the family. We found it. It's not doing anything. Let's see if we can just get it back into family ownership. A lot of the genealogy stuff is emotionally driven. And then we realised, actually, it was probably quite a good business proposition as well. One or two people said, there's a recession on. But mainly, people said, wow, what an amazing idea. The Brooks were innocents in paradise when Roger Dove took them under his wing. 2008, I gave a, a lecture at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And at the end of it, a couple came and said, we've just discovered that we are direct descendants of the Grossmith family. And I said, oh, and we started to talk about how maybe this house could be revived. But given how fast scent tastes are changing today, is it possible that perfumes created over a century ago can still have appeal? Some of the ideas they had were so removed from how the market is today. It is not what is generally fashionable in the market, but the cost of producing a scent like this is extraordinary because of the volume of natural raw materials, really of the very, very highest quality. Mm. I don't think that it will ever be mainstream, but that's part of its appeal. And this very slight retrospective feel, you mm. know, they're, they're, they're of a particular period in history, and I think people crave, certain people crave it because it suggests something legitimate and authentic. The Brooks hope to reconnect perfume connoisseurs with the scents of the past. They're not making fragrance for the fast-changing mass market. People probably like what they would call a light perfume, something that's got a lot of head notes and then rather disappears, that they refresh during the day several times. Um, ours are, are not like that. You can see the names are very exotic. This is designed to conjure up the Japanese lotus lily and the mysterious country of Japan, because in 1888 it, had, it was only just kind of opening up. Everybody was very interested in the Orient. Yeah. This, is, this has got a lot of bitter orange at the top. It's got quite, quite a bit of start. It's quite dry. I think it's like dry wine or something. I think people often say, Oh, that's very different. I haven't smelt anything like that before. And I think they always, yeah, they always find them very rich. Let it settle, let it, let it yes. dry down, and then smell it in a few minutes' time. It's such a personal thing. Does it remind you of anything? Yes, Shalimar, one of them I absolutely mm -hmm. detect. It isn't instant gratification. There's, I mean, obviously there's a lovely start and a lovely heart note, but it carries on, there's progress, uh, and it takes time. Fashion um, for, for these ingredients. I like this. Good. You. Have we got the name of this? You have. That's mm -hmm. Chanel Nassim. Yeah. They are a very rich mixture. It, it, I, mean, I think it's, it's rich uh, start to finish. These perfumes transported Victorian ladies to the exotic Orient. Over at Harrods, the ladies of the modern Orient can't get enough of them. Roger Dove has to get to work early. It's just coming up to 20 to 10, and the doors of Harrods will open at 10 o'clock. In the summer, we have a very large Middle Eastern clientele. They love scent. The number one doesn't translate into um, English from Arabic, because uh, most of our Middle Eastern clients will come and buy three, six, ten, twelve bottles of fragrance. Uh, we have just uh, received in these fantastic uh, presentations, which are in Baccarat crystal. The bottles are made totally by hand. And I just heard this morning that a client came yesterday who wanted to buy three pieces of each of these uh, fragrances. The Grossmith Baccarat presentations retail for around £6,000 uh, a piece. And they wanted nine of them? And they wanted nine of them. It, that's one order? And that's one order. 
the Brooks' big opportunity might be selling the Orient a vision of Victorian England. Anne Gottlieb is on her own odyssey. After weeks of refinement and adjustment, she has what she hopes is the next links. But until the teenage lads of Sao Paulo have approved it, it's still work in progress. If Gottlieb has misjudged the Brazilian scent palette, it'll be back to the drawing board. Hi, it's great to see you again. Great to see you. Yeah. How was your trip? so happy to be in this city. I love Brazil. Brazil's the biggest fragrance market in the world, and fragrance is selling like crazy. And it is an opportunity for brands to come here and sell their wares, and you don't get what they like unless you can talk to them and see what they keep in their bathrooms. And that's the way to really create products that they, that they love. The last Brazilian census, there were over 27 million boys about to turn 15. What do you do if they don't like it? What will we do? Well, at this point in time, it's really just a piece of information so that we have some idea of really forecasting and doing um, all of the other logistics. At this point, it will be um, very sad if they don't like it. We are going in thinking that um, this is sort of what is called a disaster check. And I hope that that, ne that word never pops up again in the course of this product. One of the things, the aspects about this culture that fascinates me so is their attitude about sex. It's extraordinarily liberal and free. And this is true of, of guys and girls, which Maybe it's one of the reasons they smile so much all the time. Is it all about sex? Um, it's all about sensuality. I'm not sure it's all about sex. For guys, it's all about sex. Gottlieb has 48 hours to hear if groups of adolescents like her body spray. The boys are younger than Gottlieb had expected, so the focus group has to feel informal a bit of a game. Behind a two-way mirror, executives hang on their every word with millions of dollars at stake. When it comes time for the boys to grade the scent, the results are curiously similar. 10. 8. 8. 10. 9. 7. Seven, nine. Look at how uncomfortable it makes them. They're all giggling. Yeah. All the others yeah. seems to repeat yeah. this is the, the same, same, sure. the same word, the sure. same. Yeah, and sometimes in these, to dominate the one person's opinion, mm -hmm. and then everybody shares yeah. the yeah. same yeah. opinion. I traveled quite a distance to come here so that when a chunk of time is somewhat wasted because the group really does not give any feedback that's viable, it's frustrating. It's a waste of time. Failure is not an option. The middle market is incredibly competitive and other companies have been making their mark here for decades. Sales to Brazilian fragrance fans account for 20% of Avon's worldwide revenue. Juliana de Faria and Ana Alvarez are marketing executives. We got a lot of different words to talk about smells. It's like the Eskimos with the words in, in, uh, for ice or cold or water or whatever. So we have CC, Budum, eh, Fudum, yeah. <laughs> almost like slangs for, for describing bad odor. <laughs> Jule, like it's just a lot of bad words. Yeah. 
But then you have a lot of good words also for describing when you smell good, like fresquinha, cheirosinha, gostosinha. Inha, a lot of inhas, a lot of... Um, what, do, what do they mean? What, is fresh, what do those words mean? Fresh and clean, mostly, but the inha makes it like... Uh, yummy. Yummy, yummy. like... Yummy. Avon's success depends on women selling an intimate product to customers who are also friends. In Brazil, they don't have a sales force, they have an army. 1.5 million reps in Brazil alone. 1.5 million yeah. women selling Avon cosmetics? Women and men. Almost 1% of the Brazilian population is in an Avon rep. Every woman, every man, they don't have access to the Chanel's of the world. Mm -hmm. So what happens is from a taste-making perspective, the Brazilian market is kind of an island where local players have sort of shaped the way that Brazil smells. Trends that are very pervasive in New York, very pervasive in Europe, don't necessarily translate here. So when we brief a fragrance house, an international perfumer that's developing something for Avon, he has to take into account Brazil interpret the trends from a Brazilian perspective. And if you don't do well here, if you're an Avon fragrance that's not doing so well here, are you likely to get knocked off the list? Because if you don't do well here, Absolutely, you're out. absolutely. Some of Avon's scents are manufactured locally by fragrance company Givardin. They believe in total immersion and have bought French perfumer Thierry Bessard to live here and permanently adjust his nose. Looks nice, but very strong. Very natural. It's a bit creamy as well. Quite interesting. I think that would be very good in a masculine or feminine fragrance. I, uh, I came here for six months, and it's been 15 years now <laughs> to me as a perfumer. It's fantastic to work in a country where all the people love fragrances, you know. Okay, it's called Everest. Everest. Okay, so that's probably why it smells so fresh. Here it's very important that the fragrance is always very fresh. It has to be fresh and clean as well. But at the same time, they want something that is a bit sensual as well. Smells have different meanings in different cultures. It's been an education for the Frenchman. Fruity notes, you know, they're not the same as in Europe, partly because you don't have the same fruits. We think in Europe vanilla is uh, very sweet and um, it's a heavy fragrance and so on. Here it's very often considered a fresh uh, fragrance. You have to adapt to uh, that type of uh, thinking. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much. Você está com fragrância? Ok, isso é Kenzo Om. Well, I was certainly confused with the lavender. You know, when you come from Europe, you know, you think lavender is um, all for the old lady, or it's a masculine fragrance. Here, it's very much loved by feminine, by uh, women, actually. Actually, you wouldn't find that many fragrances with chocolate or coffee here. Uh, I think partly because, um, you know, they don't like to find on their skin something that they drink all the time. Especially it's, it's, local. Local, really it's the very best, very best materials without reference to cost. This is beautiful. That's why they are Peter Dodds has the ear and the credit card of the royal family. He selects all their luxury items. And this is Chemin de Cine. Mm. A sweet opening, it's but not as sweet. Yes. But yes. Yes. this is also a Chemin de Cine. Florentine mm. Oris, so very, very expensive Oris. Um, 
and um, it's becoming my favourite. It's favourite out in the Gulf. We've used really, really lovely materials. We've gone, gone for it and we've done it properly. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it's a real beautiful. pleasure it's to, to, to share some memory. Really, really, huh? Oh, that's beautiful. gorgeous. This is the picture of your really grand, 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 grand mother. Right, it's really this is the perfume. Really lovely. Powdered. <laughs> really lovely. Powdered. Mm. She loved it, this one, believe me. And it's a gorgeous one, but it really was. Yeah. Yes. 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 Wear by, uh, by ladies also. Yes. yes. This is so. very. Yes. Hello, good morning. It's the palace. Yes, good morning. State business. Okay, in three o'clock, have the swimming pool ready. All right. Yes, please. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, so, yeah. so this is the spicy one. Fula. This is the fula. Fula. Riches of the Middle East. Gold plated. You are the first one who discovered. Uh, yes. So that is. Hello. The palace again. Find it, sir. Yes, how are you, sir? Good, thank you. Yeah, he is aware of this. He will um, inform uh, Major Carla to uh, arrange this. Yes? Okay. No problem. Oh, it's a no problem. Inshallah. Okay, sir. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, welcome. <laughs> yes. So I have a, I have a little gift for you, which uh, I'd be very grateful if you will accept. There's a two mil vial of each of the three oh, in there for you. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Sam. I think because there's always been a stigma in the West to a certain extent that you know men shouldn't go and have a manicure or they shouldn't. It was a shame. It was a shame. It wasn't a manly thing to do, you know. Yeah. But of course now men, mm. you know, in in the Arabic part mm. of the world and even sort of in far eastern parts, mm. I think they tend to look after themselves better than mm. probably we do in the West. Yeah. It's part of their culture. Yeah. It's part of their culture. Thank Pleasant you. journey back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a charming man. Yes. <laughs> the brothers in action. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dealings with the palace are hush hush, not rush rush. Simon and Bashir head for the airport and Oman, the next kingdom in need of their fragrance. Brazil, it's morning for Anne Gottlieb. Her first Axe focus group didn't yield reliable results. The second must deliver the local stamp of approval for her new body spray. Gottlieb has just 12 hours left in Brazil. These teens have more power than they know. I'm Ann Gottlieb. This looks like a perfect group. Absolutely perfect. They're, they're certainly the age. In, in just thinking about what my expectations were, this is, this is it. Now I would like you to introduce yourselves. I'm Fernandes, I am 20 years old. I... Studying civil engineering. I'm engaged. I use a deodorant to make me feel confident, you know, that it will work. How do you apply the deodorant? Do you mean to show it? Yeah, it's a aerosol, you know, it's a spray, so I go like this. Look at him, (laughs) all over the place. Then I apply it on my body as well, in my, when I'm going to play soccer. Right the now. test version of Axe has and correctly predicted their tastes. When I'm watching respondents in a focus group, 
I watch their faces as well as anything else because their eyes and facial expressions speak volumes about what their nose is perceiving. I think it's very good. What does it make you think of? It's a strong smell of flowers, I think. I've tried so much. This is the best, the best of all. This is a type of deodorant that if you spray it on your body, you don't need to wear perfume. Distinctive smell, and it's pleasant. It's good. It, yeah, it reminds me of a fine fragrance. It reminds me of a... <laughs> the guest bathroom, guest bathroom when you have mm -hmm. uh, like uh, good soaps, you know, or flower scents. It smells of woman, you know, of women. It's like a woman's perfume, a woman fragrance. No. The other brand, the other fragrances, I don't think construction workers would you could use, but not this one. This one they wouldn't use. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, right, I guess that that's their idea. Yeah of plumbers or yeah. something, right? Because I like chocolate. <laughs> because every woman likes chocolate. Mm -hmm. So the mix of the chocolate with my chocolate works on it. It smells of coconut. And I think of Malibu, the drink. Oh, Malibu. Oh, meninos. Olha, eu trouxe aqui a moça que faz as fragrâncias do Axe. Wow. Yeah, it made me so happy because this is the newest one and I'm so glad you liked it. I heard that you thought that it smelled a little bit feminine and men's fragrances are going in that direction. But who said that there was coconut? Mas quem falou que tinha um cheiro de coco? There is. And, and you like chocolate, right? It's like, it's sort of like the chocolate fragrance where it's very yummy. And the truth is that things that appeal to your mouth are sexy and they appeal to your nose too. That's what makes you think it's sexy. Isn't that what we had some concerns about the fact that this was a brand new fragrance and that it was a little bit on the feminine side. And so it was reassuring to hear that even even though they perceived that, it was fine. What I also did find about this, and it certainly plays into the, um, my own knowledge of the Brazilians, is they're happy. And they sat here talking about fragrance in loving terms. And that's exactly why I have such faith that this country is going to just fly ahead of everybody else in terms of fragrance usage. Gottlieb heads home to make the spray even more of a must-have for these boys. Simon and Amanda's scents already enjoy must-have status in the Gulf states. We've, we've been very fortunate. We've had lots of cover of, of in, in this sort of magazine, a whole section dedicated to our launch in Qatar. Now the breeze has carried the heady fragrance into Central Asia. We have an order from Kazakhstan, and he had gone into Roger's perfumery and um, seen our perfume, smelt it, and just thought it was stunning, and sent me an email from, uh, from Amati in Kazakhstan, and we'll ship out to Kazakhstan. His Victorian potions have served him well, but how long before Simon changes direction and makes something more modern. It's an aim of ours to innovate. We've got to innovate the business to keep it going. Um, and innovation means new perfumes, not just going to our back catalogue and taking, ah, oh, this one was jolly good, let's, let's have a go at that. Um, I don't think we're going to be doing that um, with many of our, or many of our perfumes. I think we, we will innovate. Uh, and that'll, that'll be a big thing. Will it be successful? Will it be liked? Will it, uh, uh, will it have the romance? Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. I would like to introduce Simon Brook, who owns the house of Grossman. Thank you very much. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Roger, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along this morning. The Brooks face a challenge. 
Their lineage is their strength, but brands that are only about the past risk becoming museums. Simon and Amanda's next fragrances must nod to their antique heritage, but smell of the 21st century. We launched with three classic English perfumes. Perfumes in the future for us will be based on the original, and then we go on this journey, and then we modernize. You've got to think that the, the market, you're, you're creating something that you want to make people feel young. You want to change their perception of, of their age, and that's one of the obstacles, one of the hurdles that we need to overcome, I think, a little bit in the UK. In New York, scent guru Anne Gottlieb is still hard at work on the Lynx account. The input of the Brazilian teenagers is reshaping the next version. A tremendous amount of work followed the trip to Brazil. We were going for something that was a little richer and darker of fragrance, and as a result of having the focus group opinions of, of all the people that we, we um, polled, we've started adding more freshness to the fragrances, a little bit of fruitiness. What's true for Axe is being replicated across the fragrance industry. What may have been businesses driven by the States or being driven by Europe are going to be driven by China, by Brazil, by India, um, and marketers are gearing up for that. And we're looking at a cultural shift right now. So it may well be that tastes will shift and in 10 years we will be impacted by what the Chinese like. The Western fragrance industry is trying to get to grips with the tastes of China, Brazil, and India. But how long before these new markets are doing it for themselves? Replacing the smell of perspiration with the sweet scent of aspiration. Another chance to catch this evening's Art Deco icon here on BBC4 tonight at quarter to two with a trip to London Transport Headquarters. And coming up next this evening, we're heading back to Glamour's Golden Age. <laughs>